Kia ora koutou. When I was five years old, I was a spaceship pilot. I was flying across a vast landscape of volcanic activity, looking down and dodging vertical jets of hot lava, attacked by robotic dinosaurs from, from above and below. Or at least, this is what was happening in my mind instead of listening to my teacher. In fact, I was so distracted so much of the time that they took me out of school to check if I was deaf. My teacher was sure that no one could actually be that inattentive. Turns out my hearing was fine. There was nothing wrong with me, but I was often very bored. This has been kind of the story of my life in lots of ways is that I've always known that I've had these amazing spaces that I can escape to of my imagination, that if anything got a bit boring or tedious, then I could step into whatever worlds I could dream up. Reverie, daydreaming, zoning out, tripping out, whatever you want to call it, that's often been my refuge. And it's a big part of why I became an artist. Um, to me, to be able to have a job where this sort of, these sort of spaces can be part of what I do is, is definitely uh, an amazing thing. I have noticed over the last 10 years or so though that daydreaming has been somewhat under threat. And I think a big part of this is that we need to be bored as creative people, that having those moments of boredom is a, they're gateways into our imaginations. So the bored mind is a very, it, it's very motivated to entertain itself. So in the same way that as that five-year-old kid at school and throughout my life, if I get bored, then my mind starts generating things. I think this is really important for us. With the having cell phones in our pockets within reach, with the endless stream of information and distraction, it, uh, means that we no longer have to risk being bored. Uh, we don't, even at the slight hint of potential boredom, our impulse is to reach for that device and to distract ourselves. So previously when you might have looked at a, you know, at a bus stop, people would have been kind of zoning out or, or whatever, having all sorts of thoughts, now we're scrolling like this. There is, however, as much as I, I love daydreaming, there is a downside to daydreaming. And so, you know, as, a, as that, that uh, spaceship pilot kid, I was not learning uh, my ABCs and 123s. Uh, so it's something that uh, it's important to, I think, have a handle on as well. And for me, it's important to be connected with people and with the things that are going on around me. I don't know if any of you have had that dream where you turn up for school or work and there's a big assignment due and you had no idea that that was happening. Well, I have lived that. <laughs> when I was doing my postgraduate, I turned up empty handed and somehow everyone else knew that we were meant to be having critiques that day. So this leads me to meditation and why I've been meditating for the past 20 years or so. The type of meditation that I've been involved in is a mindfulness meditation, which is uh, in, in essence about being present in the here and the now. And it's a very, uh, in some ways, it's kind of the opposite of, of reverie or daydreaming in the sense that daydreaming is, can be an escapism. Mindfulness is very much about being right there. And while these are seemingly opposite, and I love both of these spaces. I've learnt that these are actually very complementary states to have. And the reason for this is that there's different types of, of reverie. And I think there's what I think of as low quality reverie and high quality. So the high quality is what we've been talking about, which is the when we get to explore amazing ideas and really be in our creativity. But low quality 
is what can fill up a lot of our minds when we're daydreaming, which might be things like ruminating on what happened the day before. It might be kind of a worrying about what's about to come. Or the looping kind of thinking where we're stuck in an idea, but it's not necessarily progressing. So what I've learned through meditation is that I can be more mindful about entering these spaces. So by choosing to create space for the right kind of daydreaming, then I get to access the high quality stuff. And it doesn't mean my, I don't do all that other stuff and my mind doesn't wander and, into things that aren't useful, but it's something that I'm really interested in, in exploring and, and playing with because uh, well, it, it helps me live a better life, but it's also so good for my own creativity and my, and my work. An example of this is, oh, sorry, I forgot to uh, give you some pretty pictures. <laughs> ah, yeah, thank you. So an example of this is that in the mornings I've discovered there's a a really beautiful space in between when we first wake and being fully conscious, when the mind is especially uh, flexible and open. And this is a, I think of this as kind of a sacred bubble now. And when I have the opportunity, I will just lie there in that space for as long as I can. And it's often where I will come up with new ideas for artworks. I might solve creative problems that I've been wrestling with. Um, and actually, I kind of think of it as drawing. I'll be composing images as well in that state. Uh, I know that not everyone has that luxury of that, that space, but that's something that kind of works for me at the moment. And there's other, other ways I've been looking at this too. So one thing that I've been doing in my studio is setting a timer for 10 minutes, lying on the couch, and actually just staring at the ceiling. And this can be some of the most productive time of my whole day. Which is interesting if you think about, you know, in business now there's so much talk about the importance of creativity, wanting to hire creative staff, but I don't think we're necessarily that good yet at valuing creativity and understanding it and nurturing it. So I think if you, in most workspaces, if you saw someone lying on a couch, staring at the ceiling for 10 minutes, you wouldn't look at them and think that person's getting a lot of work done. But that can be the case. So it, I think it's really important that we think about how we can carve out space for, to really nurture our creative selves. The thing that I really love about street art in terms of reverie is that it really disrupts our, our psychic spaces. So it's easy for all of us to get into our routines of you know, where, we, where we live, where we work, the sorts of um, ways that we have to travel around every day and we start to not really notice anything. Everything becomes sort of like wallpaper. And then if a mural appears, it can really kind of bounce us out of whatever groove we are in, in the way it's sort of like bumping out a a uh, needle on the record and that's why I fell in love with with murals and street art and that's why I paint them uh, I think that that's really healthy to um, to keep us kind of moving um, mentally in that way my work itself is um, I think of as a celebration of reverie so there's often floating elements uh, there's these kind of dreamy landscapes and their expressions on the faces are often serene and uh, as if they're in a dream space themselves. And partly this is as a celebration of, as I said, of, of reverie, but also it's, it's an invitation of sorts. So we know that expressions and emotional states are contagious. If we see someone else smiling, even a stranger, then we're more likely to feel happy and to smile ourselves. So my thinking is that by putting these large 
faces into public space that have these expressions that for the right person at the right time that might encourage them to feel some of that peacefulness and dreaminess. And we need more, more of this reverie in our lives, I think. Uh, I think it's very much a part of being a human animal. And there's so many problems in the world that we need to solve, and the only way we're really going to be able to solve them is by using a lot of creativity. So I think we owe it to ourselves and each other to really uh, find time to daydream. So I'd like to really encourage you all to think about how you do that for yourselves, um, how you're supporting your own creativity, or ways that your creativity might be um, suffering. Um, I know it's an ongoing challenge for myself to resist the, the allure of devices and distraction, um, but it's something to, that's interesting to play with. So I do encourage you to try some things out for yourself to see what might happen. And even if there may be some uncomfortableness that comes with that, you know, it's not, we're so unconditioned to being bored that feeling a sense of boredom if you do resist picking up your phone might be unpleasant. But if you stay curious about these sorts of experiences that we're having, then uh, you can gain a lot, I think. So thanks for your attention today. And I uh, wish you all the best with your own creative journeys. Cool, so we're going to do a creative exercise now. Cool, so everyone's got paper and pen? So we are, um, you are going to uh, do some drawing and writing later if you want to, but don't be at all psyched out because it's just for you and you don't have to show anyone. And so try not to think about that now, because we're going to do something else first. Um, so we're going to start with a visualization. So there's no wrong way to do this. So just, just be with it, and whatever happens for you is totally fine. Um, there's going to be some prompts to imagine various things, but any experience you have of this is, is fine. Um, so. What I would like you to do is put down anything that you might have in your hands, like your pens and your paper. And put any cell phones or other distractions away. And make yourself comfortable on your chair. So you might want to put your feet flat on the floor and just however you want to sit that feels comfortable and relaxed. If you feel comfortable doing so, you can shut your eyes. But if you don't want to do that, then I encourage you to just kind of lower your head a bit and just find a single point to look at, maybe on the floor or might be the back of the chair in front of you or something like that. So take a deep breath in through your nose and release it slowly. If you have busy thoughts, which most of you probably do, then you can just smile to those thoughts and if you want, if you can, just see if you can let them go. There's nowhere else you need to be right now or nothing that you need to do other than just sit here. This is an opportunity to do nothing. And just really arrive in this moment Enjoy one more deep breath in and out. Now I want to, you to imagine yourself slowly walking through a beautiful forest. Look around you. What do you see? What are the sounds of the forest? What can you feel? I 
are there any smells? As you continue to walk in this forest, you come to a clearing. In the center of the clearing is a large rock which has been warmed by the sun. You move into the clearing and sit on the rock. Take a moment to feel what this is like. Now I want you to remember a time when you were in creative flow. This could be when you were doing something creative, like making visual art, music, dancing, baking, sewing, or writing. Perhaps you're experiencing something creative that someone else had made. Just pick one of these thoughts. It doesn't matter which one. Imagine yourself back in that moment. What were you doing? What can you see? How did it feel? What can you hear? Are there any smells? Now shift your awareness back to your chair and back into this room. Notice what your chair feels like, what the floor feels like under your feet. And in a moment, we're going to look at an image on the screen. I invite you to look at the image for two minutes. During this time, resist the temptation to talk to anyone or look at your phone or to be just distracted by anything else. As you look at the image, when non-creative thoughts come to you, smile at those thoughts and gently let them go. When creative thoughts come to you, be curious about them and follow those thoughts. See where they lead you. So if you have your eyes closed, you can open them now and look up at the screen and see if you can just stare at this image for two minutes. And remember to let the non-creative thoughts go and then be curious about any creative thoughts if you can.
Okay, so now without talking to anyone or checking your phone or doing anything else, I would love you to write or draw any ideas on your blank paper. So these could be ideas that came to you while staring at the clouds, or they might be ideas that are coming to you right now. And as I said, this is just for you, so you don't need to worry about anyone else seeing this or having to share it or anything like that. And if, you, if you're not sure, if you feel a bit stuck, then just see where your pen goes. Just see if you can keep writing or drawing and see what happens. And we're going to do this for two minutes. Okay, that's two minutes. So I just want to share with you what that exercise was about. <coughs> so to start with, the visualization was a way of calming your minds and priming your creativity, which is why we I called you back to that creative experience. The clouds was just a way of letting creative thoughts build. And then the drawing and writing as, a, as an output for what might have happened. So some of you, hopefully this worked, for some of you it might not have worked. We all have different brains, um, but this is just one example of how you can kind of play with your creative self and that, those kind of daydreaming type spaces.